Hello and welcome to People in Profit. I'm Charles Pellegrin. Coming up, finding space in space. We'll meet the founder of Look Up Space, the French startup that's developing a solution to better navigate Earth's increasingly cluttered lower orbit. And record profits mean record contracts. U.S. auto workers walk off the job demanding a better labor agreement in a historic strike targeting all three of the country's biggest car makers at once. And we'll head to Peru, where the weather phenomenon known as El Nino is harming the country's production of limes, and as a result, its national dish. Well, first we'll head to what's referred to as low Earth orbit, which covers the Earth's orbit below an altitude of 2,000 kilometers. That particular space has been seeing an exponential number of visitors, namely satellites, even constellations of satellites. From 7,000 today, their ranks could grow to several tens of thousands by 2030. The risk of an outer space collision is made even greater by the amount of debris floating in the void. Currently, there are 34,000 pieces of space debris that are over 10, or 10 centimeters in size, one third of which aren't cataloged. In 25 years, that number is set to double. One company is working on finding a solution to this problem. Look Up Space was uh, founded in 2022 by Juan Carlos Dolado, the former head of space surveillance at France's space agency and former French space commander, General Michel Friedling. Well, he joins us now uh, from Toulouse. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, uh, General Friedling. Uh, Look Up Space received 14 million euros in funding last June in order to continue developing its solution uh, to the problem I outlined earlier. Can you tell us more about this solution and, and how it works? Well, uh, we uh, want to be a global leader. The, the problem is, uh, is very, very crucial for uh, space sustainability for the, for the space activity. So we want to deploy a global solution uh, which is composed of two pillars, I would say. One is, is a huge, uh, very important infrastructure uh, composed of different radars so sensors that will be able to detect and track very, very small objects in space. And the other pillar of our solution is a digital um, platform, which will be able to fuse all the data from our radars, but also from other sensors like telescopes, laser or RF sensors. So we will fuse all these data and we'll provide services and data to other uh, space operators, to space agencies, to space commands, Ministry of Defense and other customers. Well, this sounds extremely useful to, to anyone with space activities. You listed them there. There could be civil, military, private, uh, or public. Um, at the moment, can you give us a, a, a more detailed sense of, of what your customer base is and, and who, is, who is really driving the demand for, for your service? Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very young market, so it's an emerging market. So. So the customers, our future customers, they don't sometimes even know they are uh, or they will be our customers. So we have we have a, a significant number of uh, early adopters right now uh, who are, for example, space operators or uh, uh, companies deploying space infrastructures like private uh, space uh, stations. You know that there are at least three companies uh, built working on the on the private space uh, stations uh, in the in the, um, in the world and also companies uh, who will provide uh, in orbit services like uh, maintenance refueling uh, debris removal so all of these uh, clients will be private companies but we intend also to have public uh, clients customers like space agencies um, space command space forces wherever they are uh, because uh, there is a huge need to see, to detect, to characterize any uh, abnormal behavior in space for these agencies. And what's the, the time frame uh, for the development of, of the technology? Um, a space surveillance uh, radar demonstrator uh, is, is meant to be completed by the end of 2024, right? Yes, it's right. So we are running very fast, actually. Uh, it's, uh, it's a huge technical challenge that we have in front of us, but so because it's, it's not a piece of cake to, de to develop, to design, to develop, and to build a radar to detect very small objects in space. So 
we have hired the best of the best uh, engineers in uh, in uh, in this domain and also in the digital domain and uh, we are working with uh, with uh, uh, a dozen of uh, SMEs uh, academias and center uh, for uh, research centers in, in France to design and build this radar so by the end of next year we will have the first radar uh, working and uh, uh, proving that we are able to deploy this network of uh, global sensors and the, the global leader uh, in this uh, space surveillance sector um, is a U.S. firm uh, that was founded in 2016 called Leo Labs. Um, how does the Look Up Space position itself compared to, to Leo Labs? So, yes, you're right. Leo Labs is using the same technology that uh, we want to use, which is the radar technology. So we, uh, and, and seen from, from the moon, I would say, it's uh, more or less uh, we are doing more or less the same. We do think that our technology is much better. Our service will be much more precise and also cheaper, but this is the competition. Uh, but you're right to say that uh, Leo Labs is today in the world, the first private actor having such a capability. All the others are using uh, optical technology, which means telescopes, which has a lot of limitations due to weather conditions or uh, light conditions. So you can see objects with telescopes in space, but you have a lot of limitations. So the radar is is definitely the best technology to do this. Ground-based radars, because this is uh, much simpler than having sensors in space. And Leo Labs is now the only private company doing this, and we will be uh, the new player in the game. I'd like to take a step back a bit uh, for, for a final question and, and talk about the wider space uh, tech sector uh, as well. Uh, by some estimates, uh, that market is supposed to keep growing uh, by as much as 11% by 2025 to just over um, $321 billion. Uh, what is driving this? We are entering a new era in, in the space um, ecosystem, the space endeavor and you have seen that a lot of new private companies of new countries are having uh, huge ambitions uh, moon is an object but even mars is an object is, is a, a target now it's a challenge so and we have a lot of uh, private companies providing space services because space is more accessible than before and there is this new space economy rising up uh, due to this much more easier uh, access to space, but also due to the fact that the, the space economy is now 80% on the downstream market. Space is providing a lot of data for all the uh, uh, verticals uh, like infrastructure, energy, uh, growth, uh, uh, health, and uh, so all this, the data from space are used by private actors. They need space infrastructure. So this is a, a overall uh, space economy that is rising right now. General Michel Friedling, you are the co-founder and CEO of Look Up Space. Thanks for being with us on France 24. Thank you very much. Thank you. A first in U.S. automobile union history. After an existing labor contract expired without a deal, members of the UAW, the United Auto Workers, have gone on strike against the big three all at once. Whether it's Ford, GM, or Chrysler's parent company Stellantis, they're all now dealing with a walkout targeting crucial plants in their supply chains. Well, Yuka Roye from France 24's business desk joins us now. Yuka, uh, take us through the union's demands. Well, Charles, fair treatment is really at the heart of this strike. One of the UAW's top demands is eliminating tiers. Now, currently, employees are paid different wages for doing the same job, depending on how long ago their contracts were signed, meaning that temporary workers are earning half of what their seasoned colleagues make. The union wants a more equal pay system. They also demand a significant pay increases. The initial demand was a 40% raise over four years. That's how much the salaries of the CEOs of these car, car makers rose over the past four years. But the union also wants cost of living salary adjustments restored to catch up with inflation. Other demands include more paid time off, medical benefits for retired workers, as well as increased pensions, as well as the right to strike against plant closures. 
Well, the, one of the UAE, UAW's leading slogans has been, uh, record profits mean record contracts. That's right. Well, the striking workers say that they were never fully compensated for the sacrifices they made uh, after the 2008 crisis when General Motors and Chrysler needed to be bailed out with taxpayer money. The automakers soon returned to profit. The big three's combined income surged 92 percent from 2013 to 2022, totaling a quarter of a trillion dollars. Now, the union says workers should get a fair share of that. The car makers argue that they are offering record contracts, including double-digit pay rises, but that's still not good enough for the UAW. The companies argue they instead need to invest massively into the transition to electric vehicles. Well, as that race heats up, US car makers have been investing massively into new battery and electric car facilities, fueled in part by the Biden administration's uh, tax credits under the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, now, the Detroit three are lagging, though, uh, in the race. Tesla holds 60% of the US electric car market compared to just 11% uh, for the three combined. And China accounts for 60% of global EV sales. The car makers say uh, that a generous settlement could saddle them with, with costs uh, that would force them to raise prices above their competitors. Yukoroya, thank you very much. Well, over the past few weeks, the price of limes in Peru has reached record levels. Between July and August, they surged 70 percent, and they've tripled since the start of the year. This is largely due to the floods and extreme heat caused by the El Nino weather phenomenon. The variety of limes used for ceviche, the national dish, has been particularly hard hit. Our correspondents in Peru, Juliette Chignon and Guillaume Guzalbes, met the restaurant owners who are most affected. Lime juice is a key ingredient to most Peruvian cuisine. Without it, the national dish loses all its flavor. For a ceviche, you need four to five limes, but if they are smaller, then you need more. This restaurant is renowned for its ceviche. They buy 110 kilos of limes a week on average. Rising prices are having a big impact. Normally a kilo costs me around one and a half dollars. Now it's more like four to five dollars. For 110 kilos, I'm spending more than 500 dollars. Before it was around 160. There's often less produce around at the end of the summer, but this year sellers at wholesale markets are calling it a shortage. In May, June and July, there was heavy rain in the north, which affected the plantations. The same thing happened with El Nino, which destroyed tons of fruit. That's why there isn't enough produce. Lime plants cannot stand the rise in temperature caused by El Nino, a phenomenon that also encourages greater numbers of crickets and other pests in the crops. All this in a time of rising fertilizer prices with little help from the government. The price of fertilizer has tripled. That means the amount of urea and other fertilizing chemicals being used has dropped or is not present at all. We were already having problems with low production, and El Nino has essentially made the situation worse. The authorities expect prices to stabilize within the next two months, but at a level that's likely to remain higher than previous years. We'll have to leave it at that for now. If you want to watch some of our other shows, please visit France24.com. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to us on social media. In the meantime, thank you for watching and stay tuned.